G'day and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. Now, if you're an Eagle Eye viewer, you might notice that we're not in the office uh, and Scott and James aren't here. As a matter of fact, Paul is here. Howdy. How you doing, Paul? Good. He says howdy because we're in America at the moment. Uh, we're currently filming a Rivian. Well, you tell us about the car we're in. We're filming a Rivian, uh, an R1S, which is the SUV version of the Ute which is the R1T. <laughs> yes, which is the huge version of the SUV. Yes. Um, yes, uh, chicken or egg, which came first. Um, this, I mean, we're, gonna, we're filming a review on this right now, so we won't give too much away because that is yeah. coming on the channel, but tell us a little bit about the R1S. Well, look, let's just say it's got four electric motors and 1,200 newton meters of torque, over 600 kilowatts of power, and every time I hit the throttle, I feel sick. Yes. That about sums it up. Yeah, and then the, well, because then you come off the throttle and the regen catches you and it slows you just as quickly. Then you feel sick again. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, like a never ending cycle of feeling sick. Yes, so <laughs> it is very, very fast. Um, to make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel for that because that video will be coming out shortly. And it's, yeah, it's a really interesting car that. I don't know, I guess we'd like to see in Australia. Well, let's put the question out to anyone listening or, or watching this. Um, oh, watch out, champ. Squirrel. <laughs> Squirrel running across the road. Um, would you like to see this in Australia? It's priced at just over 90,000 US dollars for this particular version here. That's before you start ticking boxes. So it is expensive, but EVs typically are quite expensive. Would you like to see the Rivian R1S in Australia? Let us know in the comments section or shoot us an email. Mm, yes, uh, personally, I'd like to see it. I think it'd be really cool. Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, Australian tuning would be good. Yeah, when they finish tuning the ride, it'll be great. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so <laughs> apologies if you hear vibrations or groans from us. The neck's breaking. Yeah, that's <laughs> because we've gone over a bump. Um, but no, you you actually came over here a week before I did, uh, and you were checking out the new Lexus GX. So yep. uh, we spoke about this on the podcast last week. Uh, some a lot of people asked a lot of questions about it. We couldn't really answer any of them. But now the embargo has lifted. So tell us. Tell us a little bit about the GX and I guess what is now, what we can now talk about publicly. Yeah, look, it's, I, I was personally confused by it to start with because it shares a platform with the 300 series. It'll share a platform with the Land Cruiser, which is what they're calling it in the States, but we will know as the Prado. And it shares a platform with the LX, which is the big expensive version of the 300 series. So it's a bit of a confusing one. Uh, and then to top off the confusion, it's available with a turbocharged petrol V6, a 3.4 liter, uh, which is a similar engine to what they have in the LX, but a slightly lower tune. So 260 kilowatts of power. So still plenty of punch, um, but it is the only engine that'll be available in Australia. On the pricing front, we don't know exact pricing yet, but they reckon it'll start from around $110,000 before on-road costs. So what do you reckon about that pricing? That, I mean, that's a lot. Like, and I guess if you look at it as a uh, glitzy Prado, it's a big jump over what Prado currently costs. We don't know what the new one will cost, but safe bet is it will cost more than the current one does. I guess the interesting thing with the GX is, the, the in, and in Australia, it's different in America, but in Australia, the base trim is called a luxury. <laughs> which I think is probably all you need to yeah. know, right? Yeah, um, it is a little bit confusing. So you got luxury, overtrail, sports luxury. Um, I spent a bit of time in the overtrail and I gotta say, I absolutely love that thing. So they've fitted it with 18s. It's on uh, all-terrain tires, a set of Toyo all-terrains that were specifically designed for that vehicle. And it is really nice to drive. They've got the suspension tune right. Uh, it steers nicely and off-road, it's an absolute beast. So they have a new version of KDSS fitted to it. It is called uh, eKDSS, so different there. Uh, it's basically electronically controlled, but the same hydraulic setup that KDSS was. What they have now though, is even more suspension articulation. It's almost up to 100 mil more than the previous generation. And remember the GX was sold in the States for quite some time now. I think it's uh, one or two generations old in the States. It was available with a petrol V8 engine, naturally aspirated. So these guys have been going to town on modifying them, which is why they did the Overtrail, because there is so much demand for a proper focused off-road version. Overtrail also has center and rear diff locks. The center diff is a Torsen. So it's, it's just a, a really well-equipped vehicle that it will just go anywhere. It is a great alternative to something like a Land Cruiser 300, which to be honest, looks and feels a little bit dated next to this. Now, one of the things, so the, the 300 series we've tested, I think we've tested almost all variants of the 300 yeah. series uh, in videos, and we've had a lot of problems with KDSS not doing what it says on the brochure. 
you were in Arizona testing this, um, and if you've never been to Arizona, it's basically one big desert <laughs> and it's all straight roads. Yep. But did you get much of a chance to test the cornering of it? Did it help balance the vehicle out better than the Land Cruiser? Yeah, there, was a, there was a corner. Um, it required about five degrees of steering input, <laughs> and that is about as far as that corner went. Um, unfortunately, we didn't really get a chance to test it, but I will be keen to see how it goes because KDSS is designed to give you the best of both worlds. So it retains the anti-roll bars for on-road driving, but then when you're off-road driving, it basically is able to disconnect the anti-roll bars to give you superior wheel articulation. But the issue we've had in the past, particularly with uh, GR Sport, was that indu it induces an incredible amount of body roll. And to me, it just doesn't seem like a logical way to do it. So I'll reserve judgment until we drive it, but um, let's hope it's better than the setup they have in the 300 series. Um, the other thing that, that's kind of cool, they've introduced a few new features. So on the top spec version, you can option a roof that uh, basically goes like just white. Uh, or opaque at the push of a button. So it's a electrically charged roof. Um, then in addition to that, you also have uh, like side steps that come out from underneath the vehicle. So you can see they're really trying to aim for a premium audience here. And uh, I reckon they're gonna sell a bucket load of these. I think, uh, and I guess we don't know whether Prado will get this engine, although we all well, cross we, our fingers we, that it will. We but... already know that Prado won't. So Prado is getting a 2.8 litre four cylinder diesel, which um, is going to be yawn inducing in a, in a platform that is capable of so much more and is likely to be heavier. So I don't know how they're expecting Prado to perform better with this new drivetrain, but uh, it doesn't, doesn't look promising at this stage. So I think Toyota got the short end of the deal on that one. Uh, but does it give you a bit of hope that the next gen Prado is going to be an absolute ripper? Yeah, I think so. Um, they do have a hybrid engine available, and I think that eventually that is going to make its way to Prado. And if it does, then that'll be sensational. And just based on what I've seen here with the Lexus, Ford should be worried because, uh, you know, this is this is a really impressive machine. Live axle at the rear, independent front suspension, and it just gives you everything that you need from, you know, a family SUV that seats seven or five in the Overtrail version. The money no object, the Overtrail in that sandy top, I know they don't call it sandy top, but in the sandy top colour, that would be where I'd be at. I'd be straight into one of those. That's it. It looks absolutely I think they call bigger. it Sandy Hamptons. Sandy Hamptons, yes, it does. Uh, now, don't forget, as we started uh, last week, our Ampol fuel comp is running again because they had such a good time. They wanted to give away some more fuel to some more people. So all you got to do is tag Car Expert on Instagram, take a photo of your car at, an, at or near an Ampol petrol station. Make sure you can see Ampol in the background. Don't take the picture at the Bowser. That's bad. But park in the car park, take a shot. We want to see your rides and our favorite ride each week will win $200 worth of fuel. So make sure you tag at Car Expert on Instagram with those pictures and uh, we'll be in touch with you very shortly if you have won. At carexpert.com.au. At carexpert.com.au. <laughs> That's my mistake. I will, I will edit that bit out. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. So uh, the other thing that we're doing over here, Paul, is we're going to check out a little bit of uh, Los Angeles's EV infrastructure. Now, uh, as those of you who will follow the podcast or who follow the YouTube channel or who follow the website know we've had some interesting experiences with electric vehicles lately. Uh, as you probably know from watching this podcast, we're currently sitting in an electric vehicle and we're, well, how far out of town are we? Like 50 odd miles out of, yeah. 90 kilometers out of yeah. LA. Yeah. Uh, we're about uh, 1200 meters above sea level. So we've gone right up in the mountains, which is absolutely munched the battery in this Rivian. Uh, and we're going Mainly because find... it weighs 3.2 tonnes. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, make sure you subscribe and you can find out everything about that. Uh, but we're running low on it, so we're going to drive back to LA and we're going to find ourselves a fast charge. But what we're going to do is have a look at what LA's infrastructure is like. And I think, I don't know about you, Paul, I found it really fascinating the way that they're putting in a lot of effort that uh, for anybody to be able to actually easily charge their EVs compared yep. to Australia. Yeah, I, I really want to just get an idea of what it's like over here compared to Australia because public charging an EV in Australia absolutely sucks. Charges are either faulty, expensive, half faulty. Uh, you know, it is just an absolute nightmare to charge an EV that isn't a Tesla, I might add, uh, on public charging infrastructure. So I want to see what it's like here in particular. So we're going to do a DC fast charger. We're going to do a parking lot garage type thing. And then also a street charger for people who don't have access to off street charging. Now that's, this is one of the unique things. So I arrived in LA on, oh, there it is. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we had to do it once. Okay, we've just lost 2% of battery. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I won't do it again. No, thank you. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I arrived in LA on uh, Wednesday and I had some time to kill. I was driving around LA and I kept seeing all these EVs just plugged into like wires on the street. And thinking, oh, so they didn't run extension cords across the footpath dangerously like they That was like my initial Australia. thought. No, okay. that was what I thought to start with. And then I went, hang on, there's like actual EV chargers. And so we did some Googling. We actually found there's a company called uh, Flow uh, and they've done a deal with Los Angeles Light and Power who basically maintain all the street lights in LA. And they've set up these chargers all around the city. I think there's, how many, there's nearly 500 chargers that people can plug into, they tap their credit card, and it's only slow, it's only a couple of kilowatts. Yep. But the idea is, I guess, if you live in an apartment building, you can park your car and charge your car yep. overnight while you're sleeping and not have to go and find a charger every day, right? Yeah, look, I mean, it makes sense. Um, it requires coordination of some description, which they appear to have achieved here. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I want to see how well it works. Uh, are the chargers blocked, uh, you know, where are they located? What happens when you get a whole lot more uh, people buying EVs? The uptake rate here in California is actually quite high on electric vehicles. So it is probably a good place for them to be testing this type of technology out. Uh, but yeah, I, I think we're going to shoot a separate video on that and uh, you, you'll, able, you'll be able to see it uh, once it comes out if you're subscribed and have the bell icon pressed as well. So there you go, a couple of benefits of doing that. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's to come. That's going to roll out in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm really interested to see how it goes, so we'll find out. Hopefully we make it back. Uh, I'm driving a Toyota RAV4 Prime, which, which is, is actually quite a fun car. We've yeah. done a video on that as well, so that'll be live shortly too. Yes, so if you don't know what that is, basically it's a plug-in hybrid version of the RAV4 that they only sell here. They do not sell in Australia, yeah. which doesn't make any sense, right? That, that would be a no-brainer to sell back home. Well, it's, it's fast as well. It does zero to 100 in like under six seconds, so it's actually quite a cool little car. Yeah, I mean, this is only twice as fast as it. Yeah, so I mean, this goes three seconds to 100, but, um, so, you know, I mean, kind of all have nice things. No, no, that's it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, any anything else? We're, we've got a few other things we're going to do while we're in LA here. Uh, we're going to go yes, check out a couple I think of we've sites. we've discussed what we're going to be eating for dinner yes. and breakfast <laughs> and then dinner the following night. Uh, yes, there's been a tour of all the fast food joints, which is <laughs> certainly something you don't need. Uh, <laughs> No, but I've enjoyed it very much. Um, it's it's a must do when you come to LA, especially or the West yeah. Coast of America, to go to In and Out Burger. Yes. Uh, where else? Cracker Barrel. Cracker Barrel, um, and then just get like a big juicy American pizza, yeah. which unfortunately is really hard to get in Australia. So, yes, we've eaten very well, um, which is probably why we've got no battery left yes. in this car. Yes, this vehicle weighs three point two tons, and then I sit in it. <laughs> Lucky the air suspension. That's what happened. That's why the air suspension's struggling in here. Uh, well, it did come up with a fault saying it was overheating. So, um, yeah. Yep. Mm. All right. Well, uh, we're going to go find ourselves a charger. We will resume normal program and some dinner. Uh, we'll resume normal programming next week. We'll be back in the studio with Scott and James. But, Paul, thank you so much for coming on this week and having a chat. No dramas. Thank you. And um, we'll catch everyone later.